Hello, all you wonderful 521, I was going to say million, 521 subscribers out there. Welcome to the channel. It's good to see you. If you're new here, I am your host, Michelle. Today, we are going to uh, address some comments uh, in my comment section regarding black feminism. I don't know how many times I've heard black women and black men tell me that feminism is not for blacks. Black women were not feminists. That was not our culture. It had nothing to do with us. Those were white women's issues. We don't have white women's issues. We have our own issues. And so many times I would be, uh, I would be disheartened because I know that that's not true. And I look at black women and I see that sometimes we're disconnected from our womanhood, which is very strange to me because I don't know how you can separate racism from sexism when they are both the same thing. They are interlinked. They are intertwined. They, that is an intersectionality, isn't it not? The great Mary Carell, one of the uh, pillars of a white woman has only one handicap to overcome, that of sex. I have two, both sex and race. Colored men have only one, that of race. Colored women are the only group in the country who have two heavy handicaps to overcome, that of race as well as that of sex. So when black women say to me, oh, you know, you're talking about feminist issues. That has nothing to do with us. We are not them and they are not us. It doesn't have to be that we are them and they are us. We are women and we all, as women, are under the patriarchy. It even doesn't matter what your color is. But since this, the racism and sexism are both together, they are bound together, according to this article, in the fight and has always been bound together and forever will be bound together. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, always will be bound together, even in the fight that we have today, because we refuse as black women to acknowledge that sexism and racism are the same thing. You cannot fight the one without the other. You can't, on one hand, allow black men to sit here and demoralize you, and then talk about how white people treat you. You have to fight them both because they are both the same thing, right? But a lot of people don't understand that. They have just, oh, well, you know, uh, those are our men, and they get to say this, and, and no, 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 no. You have to change that narrative. You have to come forward, and you have to tell the truth that black women contributed to their being here. They fought for the right to be here. They were feminist. And that don't, that don't have nothing to do with black men. As I said before, and I'll say again, feminism has nothing to do with men. Men made it about themselves, but it had nothing to do with them. Black women who were suffragettes were highly educated women. They weren't the type of people who were tricked into working for white women's issues or for white women's things. They had their own reason for doing things. They saw the future for themselves and for their people, for their daughters and their granddaughters. Native Americans inspired the suffragette movement in the first place. We know the nation as the Iroquois, in their nation, <clears throat> excuse me, and women had to say in who became chief. And if he didn't do his job, they got to strip him of his chiefdom and send him back to being a warrior. In that culture, women got to choose their own husbands. They didn't 
Man didn't get to decide, oh, who am I going to marry? The choices, the, deci the decisions, decisions, decisions. No. The women got to decide. And you know how they got to decide? They went and they talked to the elderly women. Who had been watching. They knew who had good character. They knew who was a good hunter. They knew who was, uh, was uh, hardworking. The woman had, had the right. And if she didn't like the marriage, and find herself somebody else. And you know what was interesting about that culture? They didn't have a lot of DV. They didn't have uh, violence against women or, or actual assault. None of that happened. And when it did, it was severely punished. On the rare occasions that it did happen. But these women running their nation, running their culture, having a say in how things went, inspired other women to also stand up and take responsibility for their lives. This is a great title to me right here. The suffragette movement tried to leave out black women. They showed up anyway. See, because they understood that we cannot leave our rights to other people. They never allowed themselves to be less than. They showed up fully prepared to do what needed to be done. Nobody, not one single solitary human being on this earth could put them in a place. They went to the places that they wanted to go to. Nobody tricked them. Nobody uh, mistreated them. They knew what the room was. They knew what, who was in the room when they walked in. These were women of valor and backbone. That's why I'm proud to call myself a feminist. Not for white women. And this is not me hating on anybody. I don't hate nobody. But this is about standing up and having the example of what it means to be a woman, being connected to my womanhood. Y'all be un overusing that masculine feminine nonsense. To the, it's about being attached to your womanhood. What it means, somebody else. Now, ask uh, in advance for my voice. You know, it's that springtime stuff going around. I don't know. It reads this. By 1913, racism was tightly into the fabric of the movement for the women's votes. As far back as the 1860s, Suffrage leaders had traded in anti-black thinking. They had even linked arms with openly racist allies who, for example, in 1867, Kansas looked to trade the defeat of black enfranchisement for the elevation of white women to the polls. The movement continued into the 20th century by way of Southern strategy that aimed to win support for a women's suffrage movement by remaining hands-off when it came to Jim Crow assenting to the ongoing disenfranchisement of black women in the South. Paul built her radical of the movement on this troubled foundation. Now, I don't know, for those of you who don't know, Paul was or was a white woman, and this was her wing of the suffragette movement, and she has a story. Or does she has a story? Initially, Paul had reached out to invite black women in Washington, D.C., especially the members of Howard University's Delta Sigma Theta sorority to take part in the parade. Facing criticism and the threat that white Southern women might pull out, Paul recalculated and drew a line. The parade was to be purely suffrage demonstration entirely uncomplicated by any other problems such as a racial as the racial ones. 
Paul imagined she knew best. She said, our winning suffrage will be the thing that will almost raise the state of Negro women. <laughs> yeah. But has she asked black suffragists? Had she asked, black suffragists would have advised Paul that there was nowhere for her committee to hide. See, they understood that, right? They understood. Racism and sexism were bound together in the fight for women's votes. Hello? When it came to suffrage politics, there was nothing pure about them. On the morning of March 3rd, 1913, black women rose early and joined the throng that assembled for the parade. Ida B. Wells, one of my heroes. Woohoo! Ida B. Wells. The Chicago the Chicago-based anti-lynching and women's suffrage activist was at the center of the true dust-up. When the eve on the eve of the parade, she was about to march with other black women rather than with her Illinois state delegation. It was a painful rebuke, but Wells refused defeat and ultimately marched with her state's representatives, flanked by white women allied with Chicago's Alpha Suffrage Club. Go. 